1958 marked the beginning of an idea an idea to bring about how one views and understands management and its potential for meaningful interaction this led to the birth of calcutta management association or cma with sir jangir gandhi the then director general of tata iron and steel company limited as the founder president cma today is a vibrant organization as vibrant as the city it is located in affiliated to all india management association or ima the apex management body in the country cma today has a membership base of over 1000 including nearly 100 corporates true to its mission and vision to create a platform for the management community where contemporary management ideas can be conceptualized formulated developed and practiced cma over the years has organized a series of path breaking meets workshops seminars talks interactive sessions and exchange programs We at CMA have taken on the onus of covering a wide area from management education to management practice with the objective of fostering and developing excellence in management all to help profit the mind Hello and uh, good evening Dr Subramanian good evening Mr Neotia a quick check can you hear me well Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening from the Calcutta Management Association to all our viewers and listeners in here. We're in for another exciting session of leadership in turbulent times, and they say that always make good use of a crisis. And what better uh, timing than to have Dr. Subramanian with us to deliver about forty-five minutes of his thought uh, of what he feels about uh, the. india in turbulent times and how we feel that we need to go ahead but just to give a context to all of uh, the li uh, listeners in here in the leadership in turbulent series uh, we had had luminaries like mr gopal krishnan mr diotia himself mohandas pai mr munjal arvin panagari uh, panagari panagari at the last week last last week sanjeev mehta from hwl and we always had wonderful sessions post listening to them and today we have dr kv subramanian who will be taking us through the next 45 minutes or so the session is about uh, an hour's duration uh, in which we'll have around 30 to 40 minutes listening from dr subramanian and then any other questions which you all have my request would be to please keep it in the chat box and we plan to take it once uh, his uh, session is done but before that i think it's my duty to also Welcome and introduce Mr. Nyotia, a no a legend by himself, and for all of those who know Mr. Nyotia, a Padma Shri awardee, a real estate entrepreneur, a connoisseur of art, craft, and other creative inputs, Mr. Nyotia juggles many hats with equal elan. As chairman of Ambuja Nyotia Group, he operates across the spectrum of the real estate industry, gifting Kolkata and Eastern India with landmark properties. ranging from residential to retail from hospitals to hotels from educational institutes to smart workplaces a pioneer in the indian uh, social housing society a sector mr neotia has been conferred with the padma shri by the honorable president of india in 1999 mr uh, neotia's other associations also include the being a past president of fiki and aima He is also a member of several distinguished institutions like Brand Eater Equity Foundation Trust, established by the Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India, uh, the Governing Council of the Indian Design Council, and the Board of Trustees for Indira Gandhi National Centre for Arts, New Delhi. He is also the Chairman of National Institute of Technical Trainer Teachers Training and Research Institute in Kolkata. He heads Yana Pravaha, a center for cultural studies and research in Varanasi, as its chairman, and also serves as honorary consul of Israel in West Bengal. Mr. Nyotia, welcome again, and over to you for taking the session forward with Dr. Subramanian. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shinoy. Namaskar to 
all fellow panelists and a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam. Very warm welcome, sir. It's my great privilege and honor to be speaking to you again in this uh, lockdown period, rather not really lockdown anymore, but in the uh, post-COVID uh, time. Now, just briefly, I know that Mr. Krishnamurti is much written about and he also speaks very often on television, so you all know him. But since it's a management association, it would be only appropriate for me to just spend one minute in a brief introduction. Uh, Mr. Subramaniam, Dr. Subramaniam actually did his IIT, uh, electrical engineering from IIT Kanpur, went on to do his uh, management education at IIM Kolkata, uh, which is, uh, brings him to a connection with our city, and then went on to do his PhD from Chicago. He has been a professor of finance at the ISB till he was taken up, taken up the job of the chief economic advisor to the government of India. Now, <clears throat> I think it was uh, with his kind of credentials and uh, academic background, I don't think we could have had a more capable person to navigate the country in probably the biggest financial crisis that uh, this country has seen at least for everyone that is on the panel in our generation. Maybe before that, maybe 50 years before, there might have been other challenges, but I don't think uh, uh, ever since we got independence, we have been besetted with so many issues on the economic front and not to talk about the COVID issues as separate from uh, the economic ones because there is a quasi-medical issue there. So with this kind of a perfect storm, if I may use the word, you were already, we were having a slowdown in the economy. Our GDP growth was somewhat tepid even prior to COVID. And now it has had this very devastating blow because of the aftermath of COVID. We are obviously seeing some uh, very, very promising signs of recovery, but as we all know, this is going to be a little bit of a slow trench so with that little introduction and opening comments, I would like to request Dr. Subramaniam to first share his thoughts, maybe 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, whatever he wants to take. And then we will have some conversation with him. So over to you, sir. Very warm welcome once again. Very good evening uh, and thank you very much for uh, those kind words. Um, first, I think, Without um, further ado, let me get on right away with um, clarifying something that uh, Harshji mentioned. Um, as you would have seen in media interactions and you know my, my pieces, I speak based on data, and uh, I'm not inclined to just give opinion. Um, in that, let me clarify that the decline now is because of the COVID crisis, number one. Second, I think it would be incorrect to associate GDP decline, uh, you know, the, the, the um, uh, declining Q1 with anything that was happened, that was happening before the crisis. Um, I've written a piece in the Indian Express uh, where I have um, clarified Sixty indicators, to be precise, about fifty-eight high-frequency indicators on a weekly basis, and uh, you know the view of the economy is based on these high-frequency indicators. Um, first, let me clarify that the yes, there was the GDP growth had been slowed down, but. Uh, important to keep in mind that in the month of February, if you look at the all the high frequency indicators, um, the purchasing index for manufacturing and services, uh, cement production, steel production, freight, exports, power consumption, you know, all these in the month of February were highest in the in the previous seven months. So they were all in positive territory. Uh, which had not happened since the month of July. Um, 
bring this up is that covid hit india in the month of march and march as you all know is the most important month in the financial year because a lot of activity happens in that so to take that 3.1% growth that we registered in q4 thereby to say that we actually had a declining pattern of growth the time had to do of course with the economy but this particular you know uh, performance in q4 and later in q1 has does, does not have to do with the fundamentals of the economy it actually has to do with the covid pandemic the need for the lockdown and the social distancing uh, so i would want to open the hood on that 3.1% because if you look at the google mobility data the google mobility data clearly showed that in the mobility was down by 20% compared to january february now some of you may say we had lockdown only starting from the you know how can i how can how can one attribute then the you know the decline uh, to to uh, covid actually pointing out the mobility that you know because of the fear of covid mobility started declining in the month of march itself and so in and, and that had an impact on economic as you know of the of the uncertainty and the social distancing and you know which which impacts the service sector significantly so now while this is of course always a, a matter of conceptual estimation but i have absolutely no doubt in 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 saying that if for instance experiment if the if covid had hit india let's say in the month of april or and you know you would not have had q4 being affected by it then i am absolutely confident that we would have seen the trend of declining decline in declining gdp growth we would, the growth would have been far higher than the you know and then the growth that we in q3 i think this is fine because they, you know otherwise one tends to you know uh, associate two things that have absolutely nothing to do with the association the one thing i will definitely do mention though is that the financial sector the fact that it was actually credits you know slowing down because of supply side reasons that's something that has been happening pre covid and actually you know that is something which you can you know post covid also you can associate with the pre covid that is a legitimate aspect but overall mac economy to actually associate you know what was happening covid which a lot of companies are doing without actually you know picking up the hood and and looking under the hood for instance and saying that was the 3.1% indeed fully because of the the economy or was it because the exogenous shock that covid has created i think that question is very important you know policy making is about understanding causality and not just looking at raw numbers but but understanding what caused and that's why this particular observation and this clarity is extremely important um, which is to say that the policy actions that were being taken in the month of june you know i would especially mention for instance the mi had actually come close eight you know 58 which six, close to 60% of the uh, you know purchasing managers in the service sector in the month of february i'm talking about in the month of february were anticipating an expansion and service sector accounting for almost 60% of the value add you know in in the economy that actually meant that the policies that we were implementing till then and indeed having their impact i think this is the first point that i want to want, want to make second i think this is again where um, uh, i must like i i i i don't think that you know what i'm going to say here is necessarily in disagreement with what uh, what she mentioned but the crisis that we've had on the financial side is clearly because of the pandemic um, you know, and there is no question that um, that this is unprecedented if you just to give you one example the world economic uh, you know outlook um, has has mentioned that if you look at the uh, percentage of countries where there is going to be a decline in the gdp per capita this year because of the pandemic is going to be as 150 years so not 50 years but in terms of the exogenous shock 
this is something that maybe even our grandfathers might not have actually lived through so this is so in the pandemic the only pandemic that rivals this is the uh, you know spanish flu episode of 1918 so that's 102 years back uh, so 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 that's the second point to remember in that context i must also mention that uh, that the that the policy government has been driven following consideration which is that while will come back and indeed it is as harshi also mentioned if you look at the indicators it is indeed come but human life that are lost cannot be brought back i think this fundamental you know aspect is something that we have to look at and not just from a you know from the health and the life perspective but even from economic perspective and allow me to explain why this is this is important the first thing to recognize in is that an average household where the, the bread bread earner typically supports four other people in other words the average family in india comprises about five people so where the bread work, bread earner supports four other people now given this particular uh, you know fact let's let's think through what would have happened if we did not have an intense lockdown uh, india firstly you know the population is almost 140 crores 135 crores and a pandemic spreads based on network effects network effects the way they affect the digital economy for instance you know to to put it very simply the pace of spread in a population of 100 people versus a population of 1000 people will not be the same because it grows exponentially and so the size of the population is something that really affects the 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 pace of the pandemic second not only the size of the population but also the the, the density itself which is very high in india you know also adds to this so it's you know um, one death and if for instance we did not have the lockdown and you know the epidemiologists several epidemiologists have research are not parameter which is what captures how you know how how many people is one infected person likely to infect for for covid pandemic is about 2.3 to 2.4 absent any event um you know uh, common flu for instance is about 1.3 1.4 uh, the ebola pandemic ebola is for instance has small pox are not is about 3.5 3.4 so far more uh, you know uh, in terms of the, uh, the the of the spread so with of are not about 2.3 2.4 if lockdown was not as intense we would have easily been looking at 50 60000 cases in the second half of april you know let's say this cases in the month of you know a, a day and now let me put one important fact you know the if you look at the mortality rates in the april for vis-a-vis what we are having now the mortality rates in the month of april were about 4.3 4.4% in contrast now the mortality rates are about 1.3 1.4% why is that the case one you know um, the doctors have actually learned how to treat it there is one of the learning curve and the health infrastructure and testing infrastructure has been ramped up if for instance the you know what a lockdown provided and this is something that epidemic has made it very clear what a lockdown does is it pushes the curve you know it gives you time it buys you so that you can actually ramp up the infrastructure both the testing infrastructure and the health infrastructure testing infrastructure enables you to test and thereby quarantine if we did not have that time to ramp up this infrastructure it is easy i think it one can easily clearly see that the mortality rate should have been higher than 4 and a half percent 5 percent or you take the numbers 50 60 000 cases you know in in the in every day in the month of uh, second half of april mortality rate is about 5% 6% you do the numbers we would be looking at 3 to 4000 deaths a day that's the number of deaths we would have been getting at if we did not have the lockdown i think this is really important to keep in mind why is this important in indian context because when you have a population where each family the bread bread earner supports four other people 
of course because of the you know lockdown and the impact on the economy you know such such families have been affected you know no doubt about it but if suppose that breadwinner your breadwinner who is the most vulnerable to the pandemic because he has to go and and you know work and get if he dies then poor the people become destitute so the destitution that would have happened you know in, with with uh, less intense in a country India would have been far, far worse, and this is reflected in the data. If you look at the number of deaths per per uh, no, lakh, um, the number of deaths in India is actually almost tenth to one twelfth of the numbers in you know in countries like US, Brazil, etc. By the way, those who actually are cynical who may say that the that you know that data can be data can be actually changed in democracy. Deaths is something that you cannot actually. That is something that you cannot change. You know, it is, and you can see, for instance, even look at various across states, those states that were supposedly doing well in early on Kerala model, for instance. Now you see they're actually, you know, doing as. What that tells you is that the data, if someone could work with the data, quote unquote. For the data, they would have been able to do that across time. So, so I think you should, you know, we must be taking those numbers on deaths definitely at face value. The actual cases depend on the nature of test, the antigen test or the other tests you do, because there are possible false negatives and you know that that. Actually, but deaths is a number not actually you know play around with. So the 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 proof of the actually. Lies in the mortality rates that we have. So that's the most important point to remember. So, you know, in in March, the with faced with the pandemic, policymakers had the choice between choosing between you know a worse outcome and an outcome actually you know that, that would be better than worse. And and that is what we chose basically what was better than worse. And and that's the you know important thing to remember. And you know, face a lot of uncertainty. one had to actually make that choice to focus on lives because once lives are lost you not get them back but gdp growth you know you can get them back and we are indeed getting them back in fact and that's the sec- that's the second part that i want to now focus on which is if you look at again many of the indicators the manufacturing pmi for instance is at a seven year high um the you know we look at the service pmi it's 49.8 so Sector clearly is not doing as well as the manufacturing sector, and that is expected because the need for social distancing in sectors and you know the way the impact of that on sectors like travel, tourism, hotels, etc. is clearly more that in the manufacturing sector. So a two-phased, uh, you know, two-phased recovery with manufacturing being recovering much faster than services because of the impact of the. the social distancing and by the way we are not in the post covid era yet we are in the post you know post um, lockdown era we are in the unlock phase the post covid era will when we have the vaccine and that's where the government is in fact pouring a lot of resources to ensure vaccines are delivered as early as possible so that all of us can resume our normal life without the masks without any Distancing, you know, at the at the earliest, and that will happen when the you know when 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 the when the when the vaccine is 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 there, and you know, large large get get inoculated. Now, um, let me say a few more things on the recovery itself. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the the high frequency indicators, again the same kind. Of indicators. If you compare pre-COVID, which is you know February or March, early March, not the latter half, maybe first week. Or even on a y-on-y basis, in manufacturing, clearly there's been a, a, a robust recovery. Um, services, though, there is, there is, it's not back to the the to the uh, you know uh, pre-COVID levels or the the uh, you know uh, y-on-y levels is down compared to pre-COVID or the the uh, the, the and that is as I said, of social distancing. Now. let me focus on what is you know what what has been the economic strategy apart from the you know the health strategy on ensuring that, that lives are saved uh, the indian government in the only one that has launched 
a series of seminal reforms um, you know as part of the as part of the atmanirbhar bharat package all i'm sure of you as industrialists would have seen labor reforms uh, labor reforms by the way have been talked about since in school you know labor reform the conditionality that the imf loan you know gave in 1991 in other words for the last 29 years you know been talked about um, and and they have not happened um, but for the first time now they've happened uh, some of the key aspects are that that 44 laws across the you know uh, that were a contract um, you know they've now been uh, uh, subsumed into four courts um, which basically does make compliance much better um the second key aspect and you know detail um so i you know in the interest of time i'm not going to go into the you know the granular details but focus on the big picture that's first thing that you know compliance because many definitions like salary wages bonus uh, and rights etc were defined differently across of those 44 acts which made compliance actually you know a a a, a nightmare um, now only four code is something that is that is that is uh, enabled the change is the enabling full time equivalent um, which is that you can actually have contractual work um, and thereby tailor employment to the demand conditions um, and and that is something which will help both the you know both employer and the employee as well because you know now without the the constraint of you know not being able to tailor to demand you know the employers can hire employees and thereby employment should should, should increase as well. second key change the third thing is replicating what in rajasthan which is the standing order you know in rajasthan it was changed the threshold was changed from 100 employees to 300 employees the same thing has been in the at the central level as well and you know in the economic survey july it shown how the rajasthan change led to increase in employ in, in in firm sizes and increased employment as well so we can anticipate same thing the earlier what was happening was that a lot of firms chose to be less than 100 employ employees so that they can escape the uh, the standing order clause now those firms can certainly go at least till till you know 290 295 employees that can mean a almost a three times increase in employment especially for for many of these smaller firms so and that's something that you know happened in rajasthan possible you know and will definitely happen i uh, you know confident of in the you know using the central law so the law what and actually something that will help productivity and you know and and uh, 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 growth in the manufacturing sector Uh, the second is the farm agriculture reform, and I'm sure all of you have read those 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 reforms. I've written a piece in the Times of India, you know, uh, commending those reforms because they give opportunity market opportunities to the to the small farmer that that was non-existent um, till now. Every other producer in this country had the freedom to go and sell where he wanted. Um, except the farm and especially the small farmer the change in the commodities act also actually enable and 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 help the food processing sector so that's you know an important reform the, uh, the 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 privatization agenda that has been announced i think is very important it recognizes that efficiency is enabled in the private sector um, in a country where the golden you know or the commanding heights of the economy was given to the public sector in, in the first industrial policy of the 1950s and in an and in a country where despite 30 years of liberalization the word privatization was never used before disinvestment was the word that was employed i think in that country for us to actually state that you know except for a few strategic sectors private sector will actually be you know companies will you know the state will get out of, of business in the, in all non strategic sectors and that even in the strategic sectors the number of state owned enterprises will be restricted to 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 you know four you know, maximum four i think is a very important change in the statement of intent and it's a real uh, 
So overall, when you combine that and with the MS change in MSME definitions, the export PLI scheme, which is actually showing encouraging results, and finally the emphasis on Atmanirbhar Bharat. Um, I, I think from an economic perspective, uh, it is very important, and I want to actually uh, spend some time giving color to what is really the Atmanirbhar Bharat push about. Um, if we if we look at the Indian economy and compare it to some of the other economies, one of our key strength is the fact that we have a large population. Um, and if we look since 1991 itself, as a result of economic growth, a large section of the population that would have been part of the poor have come into the middle class over the last 30 years because of economic growth. And, and that has you know, helped increase the purchasing power because as people come into the middle class, they actually have greater purchasing power and people have been lifted from poverty. So the Atmanirva Bharat uh, uh, you know, initiative recognizes that in one of India's key strengths is that we have a potentially very, very large investment market. But so far, our companies have not you know, uh, really focused as much on utilizing that. And you know, I say this as a business school professor, uh, if you look at the models that have been adopted by most companies, they have been margin-driven models actually focused on the top 25-30% of the income pyramid. Um, so, you know, de delivering products and services to the to the top 30% of the, uh, you know, in terms of the income pyramid, so they're relatively rich, and that's where the margins are, are, are greater. Which is, which is, of course, something that, you know, is, is important and is required. But for a country like India with a population of, you know, 135 crores, there is also a, 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 a huge space for volume driven model um, to be to cater to products and create products and services at the bottom of the pyramid. I'll give you two examples. One that I was personally involved in and something that I actually enjoyed incredibly, you know, uh, uh, to Bandhan Bank. Uh, which is actually, of, you know, it's a, it's a model of microfinance, which is taking business to the bottom of the pyramid, tailoring a loan that can actually be delivered at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, rather than just focusing on the 25-30% of the income pyramid. So that's, you know, one model. It's a volume-driven model, not, not a margin-driven model. Similarly, if you look at the FMCG sector in India, you know, India and, uh, and East Asia and you know, and uh, Southeast Asia in particular, is one, you know, one, one uh, geography where you can go to any remote area and if you want to get Dove shampoo, you can get it in those shampoo sachets. You know, the highest product um, or the, the best product Dove or, you know, or for that Navratan oil, for instance, or, you know, a toothpaste, um, you can avail that in those shampoo sachets. These are products, again, you know, volume driven at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, these are two examples of what can be driven, can, or what can be, you know, evolved at. Our entrepreneurs are actually second to none in, in their creativity. Now, if our entrepreneurs actually put their minds together and say, that, you know, we've been focusing so far on creating products and services for the top 25-30% of the, of the income pyramid, but we can create products for the bottom of the pyramid as well, and thereby actually tap into the enormous purchasing power that exists, that would be something that will enable our, you know, and, and will really tap into the, into the strength. Uh, yes, that, that is the basic idea. And let me also mention that Atmanirbhar, as you all know in Hindi, means self-reliance. And there is that, that self-reliance is different from self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is actually is, is isolation, is, is you know, has, a, has an element of isolation in it. But self-reliance is not something that can actually be gained through isolation. Self-reliance can only be gained by being able to actually compete with the best because self-reliance cannot come without capabilities. You know, and you can look around among your own at the individual level as well. Somebody who's not capable cannot be self-reliant. The same is true for companies and is true for countries as well. So self-reliance actually can come only by building capabilities. And that is where the focus on exports is also as critical. So while we are focusing on tapping into the strength, which is you know, the, the domestic demand, 
but we think about the external sector as a complement to that not a substitute because by competing with the best and that is how and creating products that actually sell in world markets you know our companies can also then tailor products for the domestic economy as well so that is very important to understand that atmanirbhar is not about you know isolation and therefore about self sufficiency it is about self reliance and therefore you know growing capabilities by 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 enabling competition and being able to um, to 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 sort of compete with the best and in this context i would also say that capabilities are not built by being protectionist capabilities are built only by competing with the best but when a company is you know or an industry is it in, in its infancy you know some amount of actually protection the way a parent protects the kid while the kid grows up and becomes an adult is something that is actually is paternal and it's it's something that is required you do not basically let a kid go and compete with an adult but you know if 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 there is an adult you very well ask that adult to go and compete with other adults um, that's the spirit in which actually is so so you know the the atmanirbhar bharat uh, push is not about protectionism we are very clear about that it is about enabling some of our sectors that actually need to grow from from you know uh, infants to be able to be adults in the in the world market that little bit of you know and and therefore some of the you know uh, the, the 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 measures therefore are only tailored towards making them capable and giving them that necessary uh, you know uh, necessary uh, support when they when they when they need uh, to be able to compete with the best so i think the the to to summarize in terms of the overall you know uh, focus going forward um, i think we have what we have done is through these reforms we've really enabled productive capacity and increase in productivity in the economy which is something that will really enable in the medium to long term and the emphasis on our atmanirbhar uh, package will also enable by the way foreign savings to come in for instance if you look at the macro data q1 we had a current account surplus of 19.8 billion dollars um and which is which is about 0.71% of the year, yearly gdp um and you know if if even q2 to q4 we have half of that that performance about 0.35% of gdp current account surplus we can be looking at about 1.75% you know a uh, uh, current account surplus in the for the full year which thereby also provides fiscal space because one of the identities in in macroeconomics is that you know public savings plus private savings is equal to the current account balance and so foreign savings in this case are therefore providing us the opportunity to be able to 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 um, you know providing fiscal space and which is something which uh, we are looking to utilize in the short run because the reforms have really taken care of the medium to long term we now have to just focus on creating that short term bridge so that we can go and really utilize the the benefit of these reforms with minimum damage to our productivity uh, you know during during this time by focusing on demand um, and so uh, that's sort of the, the the broad vision that that is that is being focused on i'll um, you know uh, end with just giving a thematic ribbon to 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 these reforms um if you look at the indian economy as i said earlier as well it's a service sector that was primarily dominant um you know if you take the split it into primary you know secondary and tertiary services comes in the tertiary sector so the tertiary sector was dominant has been dominant and that is something which is very good but we also need given a large population and the youth that actually need jobs the primary and the secondary sectors are also as important because they have the potential to create jobs for the large number of youth and that is why if you look at the reforms they are focused on enabling the primary sector through the agriculture reforms and enabling the manufacturing sector which is your the secondary sector and that's one of the key focus to basically enable a lot more job creation because that will then put money in the hands of people and enable demand to go up in the economy i'm talking about in the medium to 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 to, to you know long term of course in the short run given the uncertainty there is you know demand is 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 
it is tepid at this point in time though it's coming back in the manufacturing sector but going forward this emphasis on the primary and the secondary sectors will enable significant job creation and thereby bring demand to the that's one key thematic ribbon that ties these reforms the second important you know thematic ribbon is the emphasis on 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 markets and on you know the invisible hand of the market tied with with the with the, with the hand of trust you know focusing on transparency and for ethical wealth creation i think you know uh, while people talk about wealth creation the emphasis that i would i would place on is ethical wealth creation not just wealth creation by any means ethical wealth creation and this if you go and read the you know the 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 literature india you know being a very very old civilization there has been a lot written even on economic matters 2000 years back and even even longer so for instance if you know as disparate literature as the arthashastra you know which was which has been primarily uh, you know had, had influential in the north and tirukkural for instance is something that as a tamilian i have been exposed to if you go and read there you would find actually ethical wealth creation through the marriage of the invisible hand of the market that's trade primarily and markets uh, with the hand of trust and which itself you know appealed and which was uh, through this through the spiritual traditions of the country marriage of that is what delivered prosperity for for india and you know and this is uh, research that shows angus madison's research he basically went and looked at the gdp over the last 2000 years if you look at that for three quarters of known economic history india had the pole position in in the you know in in the in the in the economy because india accounted for one more than one third of global gdp for three quarters of economic history and that the such kind of dominance does not happen through accident such kind of dominance happens through design and that design was one of ethical wealth creation by enabling markets the invisible hand of markets with the hand of trust transparency and ethical wealth creation so that is something that 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 i would want to emphasize so these reforms and the emphasis on you know atmanirbhar you know is actually articulating is is and manifesting this vision of ethical wealth creation which is what enabled india to occupy the pole position you know in the past and by following these timeless principles i think the Uh, the evidence of uh, reforms and liberalisation since 1991, done by you know governments across the political spectrum, I think illustrate that these timeless principles indeed work, and they do create prosperity. So uh, we should basically be focusing on on ethical wealth creation by enabling markets and by enabling more transparency and trust. Uh, that's the that's the, the the vision that actually carries uh, you know uh, that, that 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 is reflected in these in these reforms. Um, so I'll I'll stop here uh, by by saying that you know going forward, our uh, the Indian economy's future is is definitely very good. Uh, you know the only part I would say is that the short term bridge we need to focus on because the medium to long term we're really enabled by 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 articulating this vision and implementing it. Uh, thank you very much and. Uh, Uh, thanks a lot for your kind attention. Uh, Thank I, you very much, sir. That was a very very comprehensive address. Uh, I must also add that uh, clearly in the last six months, the number of key initiatives taken by the government, particularly in reforms that you have alluded to, are absolutely path breaking. And it is uh, probably not visible yet because we have the shadow of COVID over us. But and also many of these things take time. Uh, for its benefits to be uh, available, but I have no measure of doubt that uh, over the next couple of years we will see remarkable uh, results coming through because of the reforms that we have in uh, various sectors that include uh, uh, farm, labor, disinvestment, MSME, etc. Sir, I would like to just mention you have also alluded that one of the sectors that have been very badly impacted is the services sector and that to the contact sector the contact business sector like aviation tourism hospitality uh, is there a possibility and since finance minister in one of her talks recently had alluded to a possibility of 
some more uh, support coming through maybe later this year. Uh, is there a possibility of encouraging uh, Indians to probably travel within India to uh, give some kind of governmental support to this idea and a push so that the sector which is so badly impacted gets some fillip? I'm aware that it is not probably possible to give cash handouts or any such benefits, but is there a possibility to give some incentives to encourage uh, domestic tourism to support the hospitality industry and the aviation industry? Uh, thanks a lot, Harjeev. Let me just you know add to, a, to the excellent point that you made uh, just by giving some more evidence. Um, that's <laughs> sort of what we economists do. Um, you know, if you look at the 1991 reforms, after the reforms were done, um, you know, it took a, a, a year or two for the effects to manifest. Um, similarly, if you look at the, um, you know, at, at what happened after the Asian financial crisis, and this is, by the way, something that I always mention when people talk about saying, oh, the fact that for eight quarters our GDP was declining means our potential growth is impacted. I do not agree with that because if you remember, those of you who actually follow the economy, have followed the economy over, over a longer period of time, would remember that you know in three years, that is 12 quarters, in, the, in 2000, the growth rate was 3.8%, 3.8%. 2001, the growth rate was 4.8%. And 2002, the growth rate was 3.8%. So in other words, for 12 quarters, for three years, the growth rate was hovering around 4%, lower than what we had during these, these eight quarters. And what did the, and this happened because of an exogenous shock. Some of the reforms that had been taken in 1991, their momentum had sort of, you know, had, had, had slowed down. And that together with the Asian financial crisis that happened, an exogenous shock slowed down the economy. Now, what did the, what did the then go, the government do at that time? It did reforms, um, did a lot of disinvestment, you know, enabled private sector. And secondly, you know, structural reforms, for instance, just to give one example, the small scale reservations that used to be there, those were removed at that point in time. So there were reforms that were done together with a big infrastructure push. The golden quadrilateral, for instance, was built at that time. The Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan was started at that time. So these together, actually, the fiscal push together with reforms is what brought growth back and growth, you know, how? From 2003 onwards till the global financial crisis hit, we were actually clocking 8% plus consistently. And of course, the, the, the global economy again, you know, supported that. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you find a lot of analysts saying, you know, oh, because there's been a slowdown in the last eight quarter had been before before the COVID, that this basically means our our you know uh, potential growth rate should be, should be marked down for India. I think you know that oftentimes there's a lot of saliency bias, um, something that behavioral economists actually you know call, which is just we're putting a lot more evidence on recent data and not taking into account some of the fundamentals in such an exercise. So. Uh, I think I just wanted to uh, point out that that even in that that time reforms took a little bit of time for the effect to come. You know, growth basically reforms were done around 2001, and the, in fact, you know, good part of the uh, you know the, the growth that happened after that was because of these reforms. Um, so I have no doubt. Therefore, just you know, inferring from history that we will again have that uh, you know from these reforms as well. So that's certainly encouraging, but sir, please, uh, I request yeah, 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 question. some light on uh, the uh, whether there's a possibility of getting some support for the contact business sector. So, Harshi, let me, you know, um, let me respond, um, you know, with two points here. First, that as I already said, I, it's, it's you know, my um, opinion, looking at the data, the fact that you know, we are this year looking at a current account surplus. So there is basically now, you know, a, 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 some fiscal room that has come in. Um, but from a, the perspective of maximizing the bang for the buck, I actually believe it is really important to increase aggregate demand in the economy. 
um, because aggregate demand, and when I say aggregate demand, I'm talking about across all sectors, you know, aggregated across all of them. That is where the maximum bang for the buck is because, you know, without aggregate demand, and you understand this far better than I do, you know, you would basically not invest as much if you're not sure about aggregate demand. And, you know, if you basically, if, if banks may not give that much credit or firms themselves may not go and ask for credit if they don't see as much, as much, you know, aggregate demand. So overall, if you look at the most important, you know, aspect now is to focus on aggregate demand. And where is that, you know, where is that going to come from? Uh, you already mentioned about, about, you know, cash transfers. If you think about why is aggregate demand down in, a, you know, in, in times like these, it is because of the uncertainty and the precautionary motive to save that it creates. So for instance, you know, if you look at the data, um, the PMJD by balances, the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana balances, um, you know, they increased by almost 20,000 crores during the period of the lockdown. So, you know, and there are about 40 crore accounts, you know, PMJDY accounts. So on average, the balance increase was 500 rupees. And now we all will acknowledge that these are accounts at the bottom of the pyramid, which typically whatever income, if they get a hundred rupees additional income, they typically go and spend that entire hundred rupees. But if this section of the population itself was saving, I think that clearly illustrates the precautionary motive to save. Um, because you know, all of us, all of them thinking that I may need if I actually become sick because of COVID or some family member becomes you know sick because of COVID, I may need this for healthcare expenditures, and that is why people are are saving middle class. Also, if you look at the deposits in the you know bank deposits, they've also increased. The reason I'm saying this is that, you know, just giving cash, for instance, is not going to bring back aggregate demand. What people need is this assurance that, you know, for maybe next some period of time, their income will be will, will actually not be impacted. That's when they will go and, you know, and spend and that will bring back aggregate demand. So the focus has to be, therefore, on ways in which you know, the, the um, income can actually be, be sustained and thereby, you know, aggregate demand can be brought in. So the response to you is that rather than focusing on sectors, which actually, you know, I, 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 I'm empathetic to what you're saying, but, you know, one of the key aspects of policy making is to ensure that the taxpayer rupee is actually the impact of that is maximized. So the fiscal space that we are getting, we need to ensure that that is spent in a way that really brings back aggregate demand because the positive spillover effects that it will have on investment, that it will have on, you know, on, on other consumption as well, and on, you know, and on the banking sector itself, NPAs, etc., will be very, very salutary. And that is why the focus has to be there. Thank you very much, sir. I will hand over to Mr. Shinoy because I think there are some questions in the chat box. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Neotia. Uh, and uh, Dr. Subramaniam, thank you very much for an exciting session. And I must confess, uh, it's like uh, drinking off a fire hose, you know, in full blast. So it's been real tough to keep a track of the number of questions flowing in. I think there are plenty of questions which are coming thick and fast. Uh, if you could give me uh, permission, then maybe I could pick up four or five of them. And I hope it's okay with you. And uh, sure. maybe we can have, have a quick... Uh, thoughts of yours as well. And I, I go with the first question, which comes from Vibhav Bhartia. And he says, uh, an ec eminent economist on a webinar uh, says this, uh, and he's talking about uh, the farm bill. It may not be successful because of the lack of infrastructure uh, to attract private, uh, uh, the private players from reaching to the farmers and vice versa. And then I'm connecting it to the tweet which you did uh, Dr. Subramanian, when you mentioned that the current reforms make a welcome departure from where political words and political deeds are not dissonant for the farmers. Uh, how would you like to read the lines between the farm bill and the question which Vaibha Bharti has asked? So, uh, Mr. Shinoi, that tweet was based on the article, um, which I would encourage you to read. Um, the Because uh, the article you know, has the economic logic 
for why I said what I said. And um, the detailed answer to this question would also be, is also there in that article. Um, I'll keep it short here and, you know, encourage uh, the person who's asked that question to go and read that article. Um, see, the, if you look at the data, small farmer, when you, you know, and, and this is a study that was done by professors at IIM Ahmedabad, they looked at what is the share of the, you know, of the surplus. So when, when you know, a, a, a buyer and a seller come together, you all know this, there is value added that is created, you know, value added or surplus. The small farmer, you know, so far has gotten about 3% of that value added. In contrast, the large farmer, the large, you know, medium farmer gets about 30% of that surplus. Why? Because the small farmer does not have any bargaining power. He, he has to, he is beholden to go and sell it at the local mandi where the intermediary ends up extracting the surplus. If the small farmer has the option to say, Main aapko bechunga. Main actually, Main jake kisi aur ko bech sakta hon. If I have that option, I mean, I mean, I mean, actually, I have an option. I mean, I can actually give it to the cow. So, if you have an option, when you say, if you have an option, actually, you have a bargaining power, die, the bargaining power that it gives is actually very important for the small farmer. And that bargaining power comes from options. Dr. Subramanian, I must confess, your Bengali has really surprised me. It, it, the name and the language don't go together, but I think it's a wonderful answer. And I'm sure uh, Vibhav Bhartiya, uh, look at the tweet and look at the corresponding link. I'm sure you'll have more answers there. Uh, we, we did talk about manufacturing sector. You talked about services. Mr. Niyoti asked about services. We talked about uh, labor reforms. This is a question which is coming from Anil Garg about the capital markets. And also Samarjit Ghosh asked in a similar line. He asked, the capital markets are booming despite dismal GDP data. The number of first-time investors are all are all on a high. How do you explain the market euphoria against the backdrop of shrinking economy? So, firstly, you know, um, if you look at a stock price, what is a stock price? A stock price is a combination of the value of the existing assets of the firm and the value of all future growth opportunities of the firm. That's a big difference. GDP data is about the activity that happened today, while the stock price of a firm and therefore the, the index itself is also a reflection of the future, you know, the, the cash flows that firms will generate in future. And, and so the, the market partly at least, I'm not gonna say fully, is reflecting some of the future growth opportunities that are going to come through the seminal reforms that are being done, number one. Number two, also, if you look at, you know, it's not as if every firm is necessarily, you know, is, is adversely impacted. In fact, you know, COVID has thrown up significant opportunities for firms that are actually are, be are better enabled digitally. And, and, you know, those firms that can actually utilize the opportunity from the you know movement towards digital uh, you know economy they will definitely benefit and that's that is some of those firms are in the service sector some of those firms are in the technology sector you know in the us for instance if you look at apple apple has basically now touched 3 trillion dollars as you know its valuation has gone up and partly that is because of the fact that the digital economy you know and more tech oriented economy will benefit these firms so if you look at the Sensex itself, you know, and this is something which we showed in the in the economic survey, uh, you know, chapter, if I remember right, chapter three, uh, pro business versus pro crony. If you go and check there that the, you know, the, the composition of the Sensex is that there's a lot of IT sector, financial sector, you know, which accounts for almost 50% of the Sensex. And many of these will, will benefit from the, you know, from the COVID, uh, you know, uh, exogenous shock because now the shock has illustrated that we can actually have a conference like this, you know, or a meeting like this, me sitting in Delhi, you all sitting in, in Calcutta. I can assure you that, you know, if, if I told this in February that, you know, I'll do a, uh, I'll do it from, from, uh, you know, from, from sitting in Delhi, you would, have, you would have all said, no way, it's not happening. It can't happen. 
and and you know it often requires um, a shock like this and the fact that necessity is the mother of invention for some of these you know for for some of these uh, disruptions to happen so i think the reflection the the stock market is reflecting two fundamental things one is the the future growth opportunities which is what the, the big difference between the gdp number and the you know and the stock market index and second it is also reflecting the fact that some of the tech tech sector financial services etc will benefit from you know the disruption uh, that is happening finally there is also an element of some bit of possible overvaluation as well only because of the you know the the, the very uh, you know very uh, uh, liberal monetary policy that is being followed by by central banks across the world so there is a lot of money that is chasing returns and you know given some of the reforms that we've done uh, investors are anticipating that you know that that the economy will will do very well and that is you know chasing returns so if you think about it actually globally right you know, there aren't that many large economies that can promise a, a growth rate of 5 and 1/2 6% at least you know every year um, if you take the united states you take europe you take japan uh, you know none of these economies will be able to have a gdp growth you know if anywhere exceeding 3% it's going to be less than 3% and i think the only other large economy that can sort of uh, have this is is china and and china is having its own set of you know issues now because of uh, some of the policies that are being pursued so india therefore becomes a natural outcome for you know or natural outlet for investors to look for the 5% 6% growth you know top line growth and that will basically lift uh, you know as they say a, a, a rising tide lifts all boats and that is what is being reflected i think that was extremely lucid and uh, anil and samarjit i guess your answers been there uh, just connecting the dots again uh, dr subramaniam on on the economic survey and i quote again i may be one of your articles that the projection of gdp will grow at 6 to 6.5% in 2021 and you also had a a eulogy of the t20 match wherein uh, in the initial first few overs but nowadays you go bam bang right from the over one and i connect that to another question which has come from ram as well as from shantanu and ram says that a very bleak picture has been presented has been painted of the indian economy in the present covid scenario how do you think we are going to wriggle out of it or is our economy worse than other countries uh, connecting the another question which shantanu asks is uh, is how is covid uh, on gdp and then leading on to impact on infrastructure and supply chain so all these bit connected questions uh, dr subramanya if you could kind of throw your light on that uh, mr shinoy i think i would say that the projection of gdp growth um i i i don't know where you you know wh- wh- why why you're sort of referring to that in the sense that you know entire world is affected by a unprecedented pandemic uh, there is going to be a global recession this year because of the pandemic so the projections that were actually made not just by us but by everybody did not you know uh, factor in the possibility of a pandemic that is a once in a century event i think let's let's first acknowledge that um, so all bets clearly are off on the you know on on uh, the the projection there was for certainly not an economy that would be affected by the pandemic so i think uh, i would you know if i if i have to be, be uh, brutally honest i would say that was an unfair um, you know uh, picking up of 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 a particular quote um, uh, now uh, let me let me um, respond to the to the to the other parts i think i've already you know uh, communicated very clearly that the reforms that have been done in position the indian economy really well for you know for the medium to medium to to long run um, you know uh, and and thereby the pro- prospects are actually are, are very good um, if you look at across the other economies you know um, among the large economies if you look at even united states for instance you know is the the employment the unemployment numbers actually are now higher than that during the great depression um, so this is basically you know you know first in first in almost 90 years 70 you know 85 90 years unemployment numbers and they will also be facing bankruptcies the fed chairman uh, just a couple of days back made made this comment that there needs to be more uh, you know 
support, for, you know, fiscal support to ensure that bankruptcies don't happen. So I think every economy globally will get impacted. Um, I, we, in my opinion, you know, by doing the reforms, have actually really utilized this opportunity and positioned ourselves, you know, well for 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 emerging stronger out of this particular out of this, you know, unprecedented exogenous shock. Um, I, as I've as I've emphasized, we do need to you know ensure that the short term bridge is 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 taken care of um, so that the the benefits of these reforms is completely avoided. Thank you, thank you, Doc and uh, Ram and Shantanu. I think you've got your answers and maybe uh, a quick last couple of questions, if it is okay with you. Uh, you did mention about uh, about bottom of the pyramid. And we did have Dr. Bandhan Bank CEO, Mr. Ghosh, sometime explaining us how in a branch he even keeps a number of chairs, plastic chairs, uh, how many chairs need to be there. I'm just connecting that point uh, uh, with uh, what the director of CME asked. And he says, the recent report on World Bank on poverty and shared prosperity indicate the number of people in the world under extreme poverty would increase by about 15 crores. And the report expresses concern for India. Uh, do you think uh, we need to be a little worried about this or how do you think we can come out of this better than the rest of the world? So, you know, I think um, globally, it, there, is, there is evidence that GDP growth rate is related definitely with poverty. Um, high growth rates lift a lot of people out of poverty. And a year like this, when, you know, because of the pandemic and the uncertainty that it has created, the fact that the you know, world economy will be you know, in, in a recession is indeed going to have an impact on poverty. Um, I think that is something that uh, is, is in, inescapable. But I would, I would think that um, you know, if, by, by, by being able to bring growth back um, you know, next year, and in fact, possibly uh, you know, in the end of this year itself, uh, if, you know, I, and I'm, I'm fingers crossed that we will have the vaccine, um, you know, by, by then, which will really, really help in that process. I think we will be able to reverse um, some of the, the trend that will manifest uh, because of the impact on, you know, GDP growth because of the pandemic. Thank you again. And uh... I'm really sorry for any questions which have been coming thick and fast. Maybe I'll not be able to take all of them. Just one last question. Uh, and, and you did quote also that um, about the ethical wealth creation and uh, uh, the amount of effort. So what are the steps which the government has taken to, to encourage uh, people and companies for ethical wealth creation? This comes from Joy Chakravarti. I think I've answered that um, my entire talk, and I, especially the you know um, the, the thematic ribbon that I tied to all the reforms. Where about that? Um, I think I've answered that question. Okay, Joy. I, uh, with uh, that, uh, I had many more, but Dr. Subramaniam, I think uh, we have just run out of time, and and we thoroughly enjoyed your session. I think it's been. The amount of uh, questions which are coming in and amount of participation, I think, has been one of the most widely participated sessions. But I leave uh, as a proud Indian uh, uh, at the end of the session, and I like to quote uh, from the Atman Nirbhar uh, Bharat that one of the first things that we learn is in in economics is actually there's nothing like a free lunch. We need to earn it. And self reliance was a self sufficiency. Self reliance cannot come without capabilities. And competing with the best is what we need to aspire for. And that's what will get India to the next level. With that, uh, Dr. Subramanian, thank you very much. I think it's been a pleasure having you here. And um, for all the listeners in, apologies for not taking in those questions. Uh, you can keep writing in and I hope, Dr. Subramanian, we can hear from you in some other session shortly. Uh, Mr. Diotia, thank you again for being there and always a support for CMA as usual. And everybody else, uh, is Amitabh, you want to say something? Okay. If, if for, and everybody else, thank you for joining in and have a good night. Bye-bye. Namaste.